Business of Drag and Me with your host, the wonderful Brayden. We'll talk about taxes. We'll talk about business. We'll talk about life. Spill the tea. See you there. Hi, I'm Kine, and here we are on the set of Canada's Drag Race, season one. My entire drag journey, I've always been my own storyteller because I think that I straddle the past and future in terms of drag being more digital. I am a queen that could sort of usher in a new generation. If you could read my mind, love, what a tale my thoughts would tell. All right, friends, welcome back to the Business of Drag podcast. Very excited because today I am joined by someone who's not going to be afraid to talk about numbers with me. Kine, how are you doing? Hi, Brayden. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, I, I'm doing pretty good. This morning, I was a little overwhelmed, like looking at my to-do list. And then I actually got to work and I managed, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's a bunch of shit that you don't want to do. But then at, once you actually do it, they're like five minute tasks. So now I'm feeling mm-hmm. a little bit better. Okay, so first question for you. I think for you, this one's going to be pretty easy. Can you tell us your preferred name in and out of drag and also your preferred pronouns? So I always say like, if someone who doesn't really know you, but they watch this and then they saw you at the airport, how would you want them to address you? Um, Well, my name's Kine in and out of drag, so that's easy. And then my pronouns are she, her, or he, him. You can use either one. Okay, perfect. So simple enough. All right, we're going to do a lightning round of questions. Are you ready for that? All right. Okay, high pressure, high stakes. Uh, <laughs> tea or coffee? Uh, coffee, but iced okay. coffee. Yeah, same. I have my vintage <laughs> iced coffee right here. Um, Tia Coffee, the drag queen, are you a fan? Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, good, good. Beer, wine, cocktails, or mocktails? Cocktails. Okay, same. What's your favorite cocktail? Um, I get like just a sangria account. I like them very sweet. Yeah, sangria accounts. Do you ever do you ever make those at home? Oh yeah, all the time. Okay, I haven't made sangria, but it can't be that hard, right? Just like wine and fruit. Yeah, I mean, I'm like pretty trashy. I'll just like put like juice and ice. Like it's like hardly wine. It's like one percent wine, and the rest is like fruit juice. Okay, you're doing like <laughs> juice and then measuring out a shot of wine. Yeah. That. Um, we're pretty lazy. We do mimosas. Like we, we make our, we do our own brunch like every weekend at the house, which is, you know, old gays over here. Okay. You have the night off. Are you staying in or going out? Staying in. I love staying in. I'm so boring. (laughs) Yeah. I relate to that. I think I'm going to start going to drag more drag brunches just because it's at daytime. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Do you have a favorite season of drag race other than the one you appeared in? Um, season six, probably. I love season six. Is that, be- it was, was there a particular person on season six that you loved or you just like liked the way that the whole like cast worked or the production? Or um, I loved Bianca Del Rio. I loved, um, Trinity K. Bonet, the yeah. gorgeous Franja. I think the cast was so good that season. Yes. Lots of talent for sure that season. Um, what, when did you get started watching the show? Um, Probably around season six, which maybe that was the reason I really liked it. Yeah. Um, so I started watching the first season that I watched like live would, would have been season seven. Okay. I think I, I, I can't remember. It's like been so long ago. I feel like when I started season one, you couldn't find anywhere, but season mm-hmm. two and three were on Hulu. And I think I binge watched those right before season four started. So I think season four was the first one I watched live. Mm-hmm. So that was that was a good era. Okay, you maybe already answered this, but out of all of the contestants that have been on Drag Race, who have you rooted for like the hardest? You like love them the most? Who you wouldn't consider a friend like before they went on the show? Um, I was a big fan of Trixie Mattel when she was on season seven. I thought she was just brilliant. Uh-huh. Um, so probably her. Okay, love Trixie. All right, are you watching her Trixie Motel show? No, I don't. I don't have the channel. What is it? Discovery? <laughs> Discovery Plus. Yeah. If anyone is watching this and they know Trixie well, um, I would love to bring Trixie on and uh, talk to her about the, fin- the finances behind this motel project. How interesting. I would love to be. listen to that. Yeah, that would be fun. Um, okay. Do you have a go lip sync song? Go to lip sync song. Um, 
probably Disco Inferno. Um, favorite place to perform? Um, um, here in my hometown, we have a bar, kind of a bar. It's like a, dr- a brunch spot um, called S and V. It's one in cool. line. Okay, cool. Always good to give a shout out. Um, favorite month of the year for drag? Um, December, Christmas. Oh, for Christmas, a lot of like a lot of the queens uh, from like the southern U.S. are saying December just because it's cold. <laughs> just because it's cold, but like in Canada, it probably gets cooler. I would imagine in most parts, it gets cooler a little bit earlier. Yeah, around like October, November. Yeah, fall seems lovely, except no one mm-hmm. is saying Halloween. Halloween must not be a a fun time to be a, a drag queen. Okay, last one. Um, if you had to put me in drag and choose a song for me to perform, how would you approach that? I mean, you're like all about the money and the finances, maybe Dolly Parton nine to five. I think oh, is an obvious that's, answer. That's that's a good one. Um, I've I always joke that if I ever wanted to do drag like for a night, uh, my name's Brayden. So I thought maybe I'd be like Brenda from accounting, but I'd have to talk to Karen from finance about that. But then nine to five would be great. Yeah. I know, right? Yeah, that, that could be perfect. Okay, so kill the right lightning round. Absolutely crushed it. Let's um, talk a little bit about your drag journey. So take us back to how you got started. I know I watched one of your pinned TikToks this morning where you kind of talked about this. So I have a little bit of a primer, but some of the audience members may not. Yeah, so I, I really started doing drag as a little bit of a slow evolution. I started when I was in high school, I started my YouTube channel and I started doing little makeup tutorials just from my room. Um, and this was me just kind of cross-dressing, being a little makeup gay back then, sort of <laughs> experimenting. I had just come out of the closet, so I was like sort of experimenting, playing with um, I think my gender identity, I guess. Um, and I just kind of fell in love with the art of makeup and cosmetics. And so I, I started putting more and more makeup on and I'd make these videos showing, it, I mean, to be completely honest with you, it was more the blind leading the blind with my YouTube channel. Cause I was like, just learning myself, <laughs> but I realized I loved it. and. Um, I started watching RuPaul's Drag Race and I realized, oh my gosh, these queens are are sort of doing the same thing I'm doing with makeup, but they're like totally elevating it to the next level with costumes and wigs yeah. and performance. Um, and then fast forward to university, I'd seen my first drag show um, and that was when I just thought, okay, this is like, I have to do this. So at, at that point, my makeup had like gotten so much more theatrical because I just, I loved it. I started wearing makeup maybe because I was a little insecure with how I looked as a boy. But then when I started doing drag and just saving it for these performances, I felt I really channeled all that, I guess, feminine energy into this performance. So that was really how my drag evolved. I, I didn't really have a first time in drag because I sort of just like, kept building up my persona more and more over the years. But I guess my first time performing in drag was um, like Halloween in 2017. So it's been five years now. I was going to say you're you're relatively, you're relatively young, right? So you probably, I mean, you said you started in high school. That wasn't too, too long ago, I'm guessing. No, no. I consider myself a younger drag queen for sure. Yeah. And so you started doing your own makeup before you started watching Drag Race. So for you, yeah. like the makeup came first and the drag came second. Yeah, the makeup was really my gateway to um, falling in love with drag. Yeah, I feel like for a lot, well, at least the people I've talked to, it's been the opposite. They've kind of like watched Drag Race, discover drag, and then they're like, oh, maybe I should. And then they like learn how to do makeup. And then yours was not that. So you started in high school. Um, what was your YouTube channel like then? I mean, was it, uh, so I have another YouTube channel other than this one. I have mm-hmm. 12, I have 12, subscri- 12 subscribers, <laughs> but it's really, uh, I have a podcast that we, that we manage and then we just publish the videos. So not a lot happening over there. Were you just kind of like posting to be posting or did you have, like, were you building an audience and had a following and were really, um, doing, doing the thing pre-drag? Um, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it was a little bit of both. I didn't really take it super seriously, but I was building an audience. I, by the 
um, by the time I got on Drag Race, I had a hundred thousand subscribers oh, damn. Um, okay. before even going on the show. So I, I had over the years really built up um, the followers over there, but I was kind of just posting to post and having fun with it. And yeah. um, what I found was that there was such a huge like number of um, people around the world who were also sort of learning how to do drag on their own. Because the thing with me is I was um, sort of picking up these tips, just being a self-taught drag queen and makeup artist because it was just something that I, I liked to do. And I didn't have like other people teaching me how to do makeup. And I think that's how lots of drag queens start nowadays. Yeah. They start through YouTube and through tutorials. And so I, I learned that there were so many people who who are also, you know, looking up how to style a wig or how to um, do a cut crease. So I guess I sort of started making videos around the right time. Okay, well, definitely there is a need for that. Um, I asked Fina Barbatol on our episode yesterday what the difference between a lace front and a hard front wig was. So you can see like where my drag knowledge is at this point <laughs> in time. Um, with the YouTube, so you started out doing these tutorials. Are you still publishing that type of content? No, you, well, you know what? When I started, um, when the pandemic happened in 2020, that's when I started stopping making the YouTube videos. I started getting bored of them. Um, <laughs> To tell you the truth, I, I sort of ran out of things to teach people because the channel was like a tutorial channel, right? So I started making videos on TikTok um, after yeah. the pandemic started because I wanted to sort of try something fresh. And then um, I decided to start making videos about math because I'd gone to university to get a math degree. And prior to that, I'd sort of kept the two worlds separate. Like I was doing drag over here and then math over here. I didn't really think anybody was interested in seeing sort of an exchange between the two, but I thought it would be funny if I started um, making math riddles while dressed in drag. Riddle of the day. I've got a dress and a pair of shoes that all together cost $100. If the dress is $99 more expensive than the shoes, how much are the shoes? You can pause here to figure it out, but if your first instinct is to say that the shoes are $1, you'd actually be wrong. If these were $1 and these were $99, that would make the dress $98 more expensive than the shoe. The key is that I didn't say the dress was $99. I said the dress was $99 more expensive than the shoe. The shoe would have to be 50 cents and the dress $99.50. Now you might ask, why would anybody ever express the price of a dress in such a way? Well, when was the last time you told a friend that you were five minutes away from them? You didn't tell them where you were. You told them where you were in relation to them. Sometimes the question of where you are is actually meaningless. For example, where is the moon is a meaningless question. All we know is where the moon is in relation to the earth. Now these shoes aren't actually 50 cents, but they might as well be, they're kind of crap. And then it kind of went viral really quickly. So I kind of became known as the math drag queen. Um, so that's sort of what I do now is my bread and butter as I do math videos, mostly short form on TikTok and Instagram. And then I, I repost them sometimes to YouTube. Nice. Love that. So would you say that that is like your full time thing that you do, like primary, yes. primary thing? Yes, 100 percent. OK, cool. And are you also like per performing as well or is it primarily TikTok? I do perform still because um, I really like performing, um, but I don't really do it for the money. More, I mostly just do it for fun. I like that. Okay, cool, cool. So you did um, all the YouTube stuff. You went on to Drag Race. Can we talk a little bit about Drag Race? I got some questions. Yeah, sure. Okay. I almost asked how many times you applied to go on Drag Race, but you were on Canada season one. Yeah. So answer is you applied, <laughs> you applied one time. Uh, and how long had you been doing drag up until that point? At that point, I'd been doing it for, it was my like third year. Uh huh. So now, like now that we're kind of in the cycle of like drag race happens every year, I would assume like if I want to apply, I could probably just Google it and figure it out. How do they get the word out about the first season of Canada? Like it did was you have huge. To hunt it was that? huge. Or I did were not. I went. It? I remember I was in the airport one day and I I went on Instagram. It was everywhere. Okay. Because we Canadian queens, like we we wanted a drag race for a long time, and we saw Brooklyn Heights got on the U.S. version, and she mm -hmm. was like the first Canadian. And we all thought, okay, well, maybe if we work really hard and win Miss Continental and get a work visa, maybe we can go on Drag Race <laughs> in the US. Um, so when they announced that it was gonna come to Canada, it was like all that anybody could talk about up here. So, nice. you know. How long How long did you all have to get your applications then? Um, like a month, oh, I think. But then the application, that process is like so long. So you do your, you do your application and then the audition process lasted like the entire summer because they keep yeah. saying, oh, we want this and that, and I'm sending a video. Okay. And what was your, like, what was your main driver to apply? 
um, I guess I just wanted to challenge myself and see if I, I could do it. Yeah. What, I, what I'm really curious about is I'm, cu I'm curious if there are a lot of people who apply who are like, these are the things that I want to do. And this platform is going to help get me there. Like, did you have anything like that in the back of your mind when you're going through the process? Kind of. I knew I wanted to travel uh -huh. um, and do shows and um, just explore and have new opportunities and meet new people. I had sort of established a name for myself and on, on YouTube with my YouTube channel. Um, but people sort of just knew me for that. And I sort of wanted to, I, I, I felt in my mind that going on the show, people would see a different side of me and a different um, side of my personality. So that's sort of my idea of going into the show. Nice. Did season one air during quarantine, like during COVID quarantine or was it before? Yes. During. Yes. It, it aired July, 2020. So right in the middle of, of quarantine. Okay, so that was probably like right after season 12 ended. Was it, was that in between like UK one and UK two? There's been like so many, yes. so many seasons. Now. Yes, it was right in between. Okay, cool. So I'm imagining once you found out, like once you all heard like UK got their own season, you were probably thinking, all right, Canada's gonna make, Canada's gonna make a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, if you could rate your first makeup look on a scale of one to 10, what would you rate yourself? Like the first time you put yourself in full makeup? Um, oh, like a five. It wasn't terrible. I mean, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. It was like, it was just a light little subtle beat. It wasn't great, but I mean, it was probably average. Okay. A five is and, average. And now, now we're at a 10. Yeah. Now we're like eight or nine. <laughs> okay, I, I asked I asked Juicebox that question and she said, um, now we're at a 12. Look at the material. It's like, okay, <laughs> all right, all right. I like it. All right. So talk to me a little bit about what you're doing on TikTok now. So I told you before we hit record that I like to ask a lot of nosy questions. So you said that TikTok is like kind of your full-time gig now. Do you mind, I'll just ask you very pointedly, do you mind sharing like how you monetize what you're doing on TikTok? Cause that's something I don't know a whole lot about when it comes to having like a large following. Sure. So my income really is primarily based on doing sponsorships um, and brand deals. Nice. So my TikToks are all like little math lessons. And every now and then I'll do a, a brand deal for um, so-and-so brand. And that is what sort of helps fund everything else, you know? So I, I do my little fun videos where I talk about a math lesson or I um, go to like Times Square and talk about the math of um, the New York subway map, something like that. Um, and those are all funded by the um, brand deals that I do. I do maybe a couple, like three, four months, stuff like that. Okay, awesome. And who's your like primary audience on TikTok? Like, are they, are they mostly adults, kids, teenagers? Like what are the age, like demographics and other analytics that you have access to? Yeah, it's very Gen Z. It's lots of um, like around high school age, college age people. But really, I mean, if I look at my demographics, it really runs the whole gamut. I have lots of um, people commenting that are students and lots of the people that are teachers and people from all different age groups, but I would say it's primarily Gen Z, uh, women, uh, queer people. Gotcha. I could have used your help when I was in college because I got a C minus in college calculus. It was <laughs> not my jam. They graded that on a 30% bell curve. And I still, to this day, don't understand what antiderivatives have to do with wanting to be a marketing major, but you know, <laughs> I don't know, maybe, maybe you could tell me. I think what's great about uh, the TikTok is that it really it really is a different audience than you would see like in a math class or even like another math communicators channel. I think because of the TikTok algorithm, it sort of shows you content that you wouldn't necessarily search up elsewhere. Yeah, like if yeah. you were in the YouTube search bar, the kinds of people that search up math videos aren't the same kinds of people that watch um, my TikTok. So I think that's what's really been great is I really feel I've been able to introduce all these math concepts to a new um, group of people. Nice. And what are your, like, what are some of your um, goals for that business? Um, I don't know. I really am enjoying what I'm doing right now. To tell you the truth, I, I would love to just stay at the same place I am now. I love um, only working a couple days a week. I love to, combining my two passions. I guess in terms of goals for the future, I'd love to 
maybe do longer form content. I'd love to um, just teach more people and do it in fun, exciting ways. I love the idea of like being a drag queen, teaching math lessons, like, I don't know, a top of like the Eiffel Tower or like in a canoe on the um, <laughs> river. I think just ridiculous things like that. Like, I, I think I, I want to be the first drag queen teaching a math lesson from space or, you know. I love that. Why you not? Could do, you could do like math retreats or workshops or like uh, yeah. event, weekend events. That's mm -hmm. That could be really fun. I'm picturing, did you ever see that? What was it? Ta Tazo? Is that the name of it? The tea company that Alyssa Edwards like did an ad campaign for and they mm -hmm. put her in like camping gear and a rowboat. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, I think the funny thing is when I was starting my my um, math videos, I just thought, like, wouldn't it be funny to see a drag queen, like, teaching about equations, not even, like, acknowledging, like, the crazy costume I'm wearing? And so I just I just like to joke around with that. Yeah, I think it's it's almost like bringing in, like, an extra spice of theater to what you're doing, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about tax stuff just a little bit. I don't know a whole lot about the Canadian tax system. I know that proportionally, like I think you all pay maybe a little bit higher of a percentage in taxes, but your tax system is a lot simpler than ours from what I've gathered. How's the process been navigating taxes like as a freelancer or self-employed person? Um, it's been pretty hard. You know, I started filing taxes just for my YouTube channel. Um, I think the first year that I filed them was maybe like 2017, uh -huh. 2018. Something like that. So I started going to an accountant, um, telling him, oh, this is like the money I made from YouTube, so-and-so. And, so. and he, it was sort of just like, all right, answer this question, answer this question. Because of the pandemic, I had to start doing my own taxes. I couldn't see my accountant anymore. Um, so I find it not super complicated. I don't know. This year I started getting, I got a new accountant this year, this past tax year. And it was one that like specialized in entertainment. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Yeah. I don't know how much that helped me. I mean, I paid them like 10 times more than what I paid the last account. And it was just another form that I had to fill out of how much do you make? And I'm like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> why Why did you have to stop seeing your old accountant during the pandemic? Did they not do like anything virtually? It was just so hard because um, it was like April 2020. It was right when everything had like yeah. closed down. And I, I, I didn't want to bother with like doing Zoom meetings. Yeah. Well, uh, people always told me it's easy to do it on like TurboTax. So that's what I did. Yeah, TurboTax pretty easy. I do they have does HR Block do Canada like Canadian tax returns? Yes, I haven't tried them yet. It okay. was, it's always been like little smaller um, firms that I I had gone to, but because this past year I'd made like more than I I ever had before, that's when my manager had advised me to like get somebody a bit more serious because I'm just so scared of messing up. You no, know? <laughs> you know you know what we call that, or you know what I call that? I call that a quality problem. You made mm. a lot more money, so you got to go hire someone and True. pay them more money. Um, so I always call that a, a quality problem. Like, oh, I have a quality problem. Um, so I used to work for h and Block in their tax research center. That's what I did when I was in college. And it was people who were self-filing their tax returns, and they would have to chat in on computer chat and ask questions. So I got, as you can imagine, a lot of interesting folks who probably should, should not have been doing their taxes, um, mm -hmm. bringing in for questions. So you have your new accountant. That sounds like that's going pretty well. You found someone that, did you get a referral for them? Um, kind of. Yeah, somebody referred me to them. Nice. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> Does your accountant also do your bookkeeping or do you do that? No, I do my own bookkeeping. They told me I had to make like 400,000 or something before they do my bookkeeping. So I was like, all right, <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my own. <laughs> Yeah, I tell people, so in our firm, I tell people about 100,000, but it's all just kind of relevant. It's really just like, if you're making less than that, like I would not encourage you to spend money having us do your bookkeeping. Because typically it's just the more money you make, the more transactions you're going to have and the more complicated mm -hmm. it is. And otherwise it just doesn't take that much time. Do you do yours on a monthly basis or do you just do it annually? When you I see? wish I did it on a monthly basis. I honestly forget. Every time it's tax season, I'm like, <laughs> oh God. And then I get it all... What I do usually, I just do all my transactions on credit cards. So I'll just like go through the banking apps. All right, I spend this on this. And I have it all in an Excel sheet. And I'm like, nice. okay, this is this is what I made in the month of April. And this is what I spent on Amazon, and PayPal, and this and that. And so I sort of track it all that way. Okay. I was going to say, I have, I have a bookkeeping template. Like I have it for free on my website. I could give that to you. But I would imagine that you're probably pretty savvy with spreadsheets yourself. 
Yeah, I'm a, I'm all right. I've tried the apps. I mean, I've seen the ads for like this app for bookkeeping, but then like to connect them to my bank accounts and credit cards, it never works. It never it never yeah is able to connect to all of my banks. So I'm like, well, if I'm gonna have to do some of it by hand, then I might as well do all of it by hand. Yeah. I don't really trust the apps because I, in my mind, I can differentiate between what's a personal expense and what's a business expense, and then, but the apps don't know that. Yeah. Okay, but that's okay. So that's what we got to change, though. You, you need to open a business bank account. I should. Well, I have a personal bank account, but I have two credit cards. Should I make one of them just a business credit card? Yes. yes. I should. Huh? What you want to do? You want to open a business bank account, and then ideally, um, you want to open or you want to get a business credit card linked to your business bank account, or or in the meantime, you could just make one of them. But then that way, uh, when you're looking at your bank statements and your credit card statements, everything on the statement yeah. is a business deduction. So that's a good idea. Yeah, it's more so just saying like classifying it and what category it goes in and not determining whether it's personal or business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that'll make your life a lot, lot easier. We actually have, I guess in Canada, you don't you don't have LLCs. You just have sole proprietorships and corporations is my understanding. So, I think so. Yeah, if your next think... question is whether I'm incorporated, the answer is no. Here's <laughs> the thing. I wanted to get incorporated like because my manager was like, oh, like, you should do it. You'll get all these benefits. And so I talked to my accountant and they're like, oh, well, you sh their advice was I shouldn't incorporate because um, I'm wanting to pay myself a bigger salary because I'm saving up for a down payment for a house nice. is basically what I'm saving up my money for. So they said there's not really a um, benefit to incorporating because the idea would be that most of the money would live in the business. But if you need access to that money, then you should you should just keep it as your salary. So that's what I'm dealing with now. So I don't yeah. know. I want to incorporate, but I, only, I mostly just wanted to do it because it would make me sound a bit more fancy. Kind Santos Corporations. I yeah, guess. I like that. Incorporated. Kind <laughs> Santos Incorporated. I like that. Yeah, it's. Uh, it sounds like, so we have, like, we have sole proprietorships and then we have corporations, but in the middle we have LLCs and S corporations. And that kind of like gives you the corporate protection, but allows you to pay yourself like a sole proprietor. Very mm -hmm. juicy, exciting details. I know. Um, but you all don't have that up there, probably because your taxes are a lot simpler. Do you know what your um, do you know what your tax rate is? Like 30 percent, something like that. 33 okay. percent, maybe. And do you pay? Um, yeah. Ontario, they're, they're provinces, right? Do you play, pay a province level tax in addition to like a federal tax? I think I technically do. Yeah. But when I when I pay my taxes, it's just one number that I pay to the government. And okay. then I just That's like nice. send that off. That's nice. I guess part of it goes to the province, part of it goes to the part of it goes to the federal level. I thought I totally thought I'd have my shit way more together coming into this interview, but I'm like realizing I'm like, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh no, you're fine. <laughs> yeah, what it's the just, hell I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, it's just uh it's just a conversation. I've it's I've talked to like I've talked to some other queens, like they said they were nervous to come on because they're like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm like, well I'm the expert. I'm not asking you to like to answer technical questions. It's more just to give an example of how these things I feel like I feel like, like I'm at a meeting with my accountant right now. I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> what are you what are you taking notes on i'm writing down get a business bank account with a, a credit card yeah get a business bank account get your credit card that's all great and a lot of the times like my business credit card limit is twice as high as my personal credit card limit so i'm like that's also fun um not that i need to like be going ham with my business credit card but it's there if i needed it so kind of on this topic what <laughs> This is a fun question. What do you wish someone would have told you when you got started? Maybe either like with YouTube or with drag in particular. And we won't do, I won't do the whole like, the whole played out drag race thing of like showing you a, a picture of your baby self. But if you could tell like a no. new drag queen um, getting started. I would really, the advice I would give would be to treat drag like business. I feel like there's, there's so much pressure on us to have like amazing outfits yeah. and to have the most expensive like human hair wigs but there's so like little transparency on how much money we're really making and i see so many drag queens like um going into so much debt to go on the show and really like working like gig to gig and i would i would say like it's nobody else's responsibility to keep an eye on your books and your finances other than yours and if you if that means you have to um 
maybe rewear a look a little bit more, then maybe that's what you have to do. But um, I just think it's such a shame that more drag queens are not like um, keeping an eye on their finances and really trying to shell out every last dollar to look like so amazing and spend yeah. so much money just on one look that you're going to wear once. That's wild. I am a big fan of outfit repeating myself. I, I guess I, I understand why like a lot of drag queens don't want to do that. I mean, I saw Twitter. <laughs> Twitter is a nightmare. <laughs> But I saw on Twitter, like, uh, one of the queens posted that someone, like, gave them shit because they wore a look twice. And it's like, who who are these fans? Who cares? But I guess some people feel that pressure. I am curious. Do you mind sharing, like, what your process was like prepping for a drag race? Because you mentioned that some people are, like, blowing all of their money on this. Like, Well, I'll tell you right now. I spent maybe $6,000 Okay. On my package, which I think was pretty average for my season. I know some girls spent like up in the five figures, but most of us spent a couple thousand. Yeah. I totally was not prepared for the caliber of drag that I was going to see on my season. I kind of thought we were all just bringing stuff from home, but everyone's <laughs> outfits were like so amazing. I was so not prepared. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of glad I went home early because the stuff I had for later that season ooh, was not very good. But mostly what I brought was stuff I either made myself, stuff I already had, or like stuff I just bought from kind of on the rack. I didn't really have connections to designers or uh -huh. had things custom made for me back then. I'm only just starting to get into that um, right now, but I guess the thing that the thing to do would be to get on Drag Race and then have a bunch of designers make your looks for you. I really wasn't at that stage because I was more of a beginner back then. I was very green, so. Um, well, yeah, that was I mean, sort of my process, process. To make that happen, like, first of all, you have to know designers, right? You have to be able to, like, get them to turn around these looks super fast. But I can only imagine, like, what the co like what the cost of that would be. I would love to get a designer to come on the show, too, and, like, break down some, mm -hmm. of, the, some of the costs. Like, are you watching All Star 7? I can only imagine how, <laughs> like, how much money they're yeah. spending, like, how much money Trinity is spending on her 18-foot-long trains that she's wearing on the runway every week. It's kind of wild. I mean, it's worth it if it if spending like fifty thousand dollars on a wardrobe for Drag Race is what's going to take you to the top three and be a fan favorite. Then I mean, it's worth it because a successful drag queen can make that money back in a couple of months. But not everybody is going to make that kind of money, so it's really a gamble of yeah. how much you're going to spend and how much you're going to get back. And well, I, know, I mean, um, yeah, a lot of queens have not made that money back, and they're you know not seeing the return on their investment. Yeah, that, well, that's what I was just about to say. At the end of the day, it's all about the ROI. So it's like, are you really, are, is everyone even thinking about the ROI when they spend the money on, like when they spend the money on it? That would, yeah, man, would I don't know. Out. Is that something you all, so I, I won't ask you to share information that other people have told you secondhand, but are these conversations that you all have, like when the cameras are not on? Yeah, we talk about how much um, things cost. Yeah. I'm just curious because money, you know, like finances are a sensitive topic. Not everyone likes to talk about it, but I know I've heard some. So they've, I think they've like brought it up and untucked on some of the episodes. Mm -hmm. um, people don't know. People who watch the show don't realize that we're wearing such expensive things sometimes. I know you don't need money to do drag and you can look amazing for less, but like people just have no idea like some outfits are like three four five thousand dollars that are walking down the runway and it's yeah. like you expect us only to wear it once <laughs> i want i want one of these um i want one of these like drag race youtubers to do a video on um like who ruined drag race from the perspective of creating this expectation of having really elaborate looks and for me i always go back to that like uh the courtney act one from season six with the giant wings. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, the... it was like, it was an arms race to get to the top and to always raise the bar. Yeah. And so it was just natural. It's nobody's fault. It's just no, yeah, no, sort of the and, way things and, have evolved. Yeah, and I mean, I mean that in, a, in like a lighthearted way, because obviously I everyone know. wants to bring their very best. But I remember, you know, like, like Sharon did a lot of cool stuff on season four, but I wouldn't say that a lot of the things that looked really cool necessarily looked really expensive, right? Mm -hmm. And then we had, I think like, you know, Roxy on season five had some like really amazing like pageant gowns, which I can imagine like art cheap. 
But it wasn't mm-hmm. until those later seasons, I feel like six, seven, eight, you saw people come on and you were like, oh shit, that looks really, like really custom and really amazing. Mm-hmm. And then from my perspective, expensive, but yeah. it's pretty awesome. Um, I still don't understand like why. I mean, I'm sure that there are reasons, but I really feel like the contestants at this point should get some sort of uh, a budget given to them or, and by budget, I mean like money given to them to prepare for drag race, but it doesn't seem like that's. I think they've started. I they think have they've started? started doing that. Yeah. Okay. That's from what good. I've heard. Maybe, maybe I'll get myself worked around the NDA at some point to get, to get <laughs> to get answers to some, to some of those questions. That would be, that would be interesting. Okay. So I want to circle back a little bit and talk about your TikTok account a little bit more. So I just took a look, you have 1.3 million followers, which I mean, I, I hate to brag, but I have 52. So I'm catching up <laughs> pretty quick. Uh, how long did it take you to build that large of a following? Um, I think well, I've been on TikTok for about two years now. So it's, to me, it felt like very fast growth because when I was on YouTube, it took forever to even just get 100,000. And on TikTok, I was 100,000 100, like within months. Yeah. And it wasn't even because that, those are my YouTube followers coming over to TikTok. Um, so I think something about the algorithm on TikTok really just um, allows for like videos to get viral really fast. Yeah. So I think, does, that, I think that's been it. It's yeah, because I mean, the way that TikTok works, it's like if, if if just a handful of people comment on a video that you did like three weeks ago, it'll just start showing it to everyone else. And then it can keep snowballing mm-hmm. for like months and months and months, which is wild because, you know, on Instagram, if you post a photo at one o'clock and no one's like commented on it by three, it just gets like canned. That's how it seems to work yeah. anyway. It's It's interesting because there's just been a whole new generation of like, social media stars that have gotten like famous and viral on TikTok and they're at a million followers and they're getting approached to do brand deals. I think because I've sort of been in this game for a lot longer from doing videos on YouTube. I'm a bit older than lots of the other new little teeny bopper stars that are getting famous. And I, (laughs) you know, I, I know a little bit more, so I'm a little bit more experienced and I can like manage my money a little bit better, but it does scare me to think of all the young people like having all this money Um, and becoming famous. I really think that my advice to anybody who was getting into this would be to really save as much as you can, put it away in tax sheltered accounts and just continue living the same quality of life that you are now, because we really don't know when this is, when this is going to end. I mean, in five years from now, nobody will be interested in TikToks anymore. Who knows? So I'm really just trying to put away as much as I can into my savings and then just um, riding out this wave and I'm, I'm trying to say yes to everything. Smart. Yeah, really smart advice. Don't do what all these tick... Oh my God. I did a presentation. I think you'll like this. I did a presentation to a group of business owners that was titled... Um, what did I title it? It was TikTok Tax Advice Fact or Fiction. And I played a TikTok video from, I'm using air quotes here, a tax professional. And I had people guess whether it was fact or fiction. So we were like debunking a lot of things. And the real popular thing was how to buy a G-Wagon and write it off on your taxes. Don't do that. Oh my God, people are doing that? (laughs) Well, they're trying. They're they're trying to. I'm like a $150,000 car. Probably not a good idea unless you could afford the $150 car without the tax deduction. So talking about TikTok, how many followers did you have when you, I mean, you probably don't remember the exact amount, but around about how many followers did you have when you started getting your first brand deals? Um, when I first started getting like serious brand deals, probably around like 300,000, 400,000. Mm-hmm. It was around then. And are these usually like, are the companies approaching you or are you reaching out to them? The companies would approach me. So it, it would either be a company or like the PR agency that the company's working with. Uh-huh. And mm-hmm. do they give you like a set? Do they tell you like, this is how much we pay or are they negotiating it based on, like, do you have to prove any of your like metrics to them? It really depends. Some Sometimes, um, most of the times they will ask, oh, what are your rates for a TikTok video? Mm-hmm. And so if we'll tell them, um, say, 
like a thousand dollars, which is not my rate, but a thousand dollars. And they say, oh, we can afford maybe five hundred dollars. And then we'll say, oh, for five hundred, we can do like we can't do a TikTok video, but we can do an Instagram story. So there's a little bit of negotiation. Um, having a manager has really helped me um, do all of that business side of stuff. So I don't、oh, really、nice. have to have to do it anymore. But there there's a bit of back and forth there, and sometimes they will ask to see some analytics and who. Um, who is your audience? So there's a bit of back and forth that goes on. Okay, nice, nice. Because I know I haven't really talked to anyone that does a lot of promotion on TikTok. I've had friends who do it on Instagram. One of my really good friends has、uh, one of those really popular pet Instagram accounts, and <laughs> they do sponsorships a lot. And I know for her, it's like they want to know about engagement rates and things like that.、Mm-hmm. But I would imagine on TikTok, like you can. You can see the engagement a lot easier just by like looking at the person's account. Yeah, you can see, yeah, you can see the number of views and comments and likes. They'll also sometimes ask for things like watch time, which is something you can only see on the back end. Yeah, but it really depends, and、um, I I really think lots of content creators and influencers should be charging more. But I it it really depends on which like niche you're kind of doing. I think because I do videos where I'm showing my face and I'm talking to the audience. I probably have a bit more of an engaged community than if you just、yeah. did videos of like you playing Minecraft or something, or like videos of like you squeezing out a bottle of slime. You know, there's a lot of ways to get a lot of <laughs> followers、um, just by getting people's attentions like that. But if you if you're not making videos with your face talking to the audience, it's going to be probably harder to get、yeah. um, brand endorsements. Well, if you, yeah, if you're face front, like if you're、uh, face forward, you have a, a much higher like level of trust established between you and your audience because. Oh, yeah. the like and I'll tell you right、factor. now, the the niche to get into if you want brand deals is personal finance. Those are like the brand deals that pay the most because、okay. these are people. These are people telling their audience, "Oh, you should invest in this, and you should get this app to help you make more money." And so the companies that are in that、um, industry are really paying like much more than like beauty, for instance. Okay, that could be a great avenue for me, but I've niched really hard into drag tax, so it's a much smaller, <laughs> much smaller audience pool. Well, you never know. I thought drag math would be a small audience pool, but look, look、yeah. where it's got me. Yeah, that's that's true. Well, who、um, can you give us some examples of some companies that you've done brand deals with? Yeah, I've、um, worked a lot with this、um, local company、um, called MapleSoft. They're like headquartered in Waterloo. Um, I've worked with、um, DoorDash. I've worked with、um, Taco Bell, Pizza Hut.、Oh. Um, who have I just worked with recently? I, I'm working with Proactive.、Um, so lots of lots of different companies that I never really thought that math or drag would、um, have much to do. Have much to do with, but it's been it's been fun.、And、that's what I was wondering was how strong of a correlation there ne- there needed to be between like what your brand partner is selling versus what you talk about. So I'm like, it's not just like math tutoring software then. No, not just not necessarily. <laughs> Those are usually the companies which I find it's very easy to integrate into my videos if the brand and the product already has something to do with math. But if it's something like、um, Taco Bell, for instance, I think I just did a little drag transformation. Whoosh. It was like it was something silly like that, which you know I love. <laughs> okay, fun. And did your followers then go to Taco Bell? Yeah, I think so. It was like I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it would. Oh, crazy hair day! I think that would probably make me want to go get a chalupa because, I mean, anytime someone mentions Taco Bell, the big difference between, you know, when I was at a place where I would consider myself more a micro influencer was when you're s- smaller and have a smaller following, you are working with smaller brands that are really looking for a return on their investment. Yeah, and so it's really about oh, if you have a smaller audience, you really are driving people to this website. Whereas when you're、um, when you have a bigger following and you're able to、um, promote brands like、um, Coca Cola, for instance, you're not necessarily telling people to go out and buy a bottle of Coca Cola. It's more about the brand recognition, sure, and you know just putting the brand name out there because these are these are companies with like multi million dollar marketing budgets that just want to get their 
their name out there and want everybody talking about them, not necessarily wanting to drive sales. But when yeah, it's they just, smaller they, brands, it's more about they're really wanting those analytics. They really want those um, clicks on the links. Yeah, like a certain amount of a certain amount of touch points. That that mm-hmm. makes sense um, because kind of the, the industry that I've worked in, a lot of us, a lot of us don't do paid sponsorships. We just do affiliate like affiliates, right? So mm-hmm. I'm an affiliate for QuickBooks. I'm an affiliate for Gusto. And so they don't pay me to promote them, but I make affiliate commissions when people use my links. And some of them pay, I mean, like the payroll company I'm an affiliate for pays $300 for every person that signs up with my affiliate link. So wow, that's good. Yeah. So I used get- to be affiliated with a couple of companies that were like, oh, we'll give you like 10%. <laughs> and if you get a thousand people to sign up, that'll be like $10,000 for you. And so it seems like it's a great deal because it's like unlimited games, uh-huh. but really it's like hard to even make like a hundred bucks off of that. So I don't really do the little commission codes anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it is interesting how it's so different by industry, right? Because it's, because mm-hmm. it all has to do with how strong the correlation is. Yeah. Like I set up payroll for people and I teach people how to mm-hmm. set up payroll. So it's really easy. <laughs> it's really easy for me to get people to sign up for a payroll company. Right. But yeah. it's harder to do it when there's like less of a, nexus between what you're talking about and Mm -hmm. what you're promoting for sure so in that case like the brand deals make a lot more sense all right what would you tell someone if they if they're like if their ambition is being wildly popular on social media seems like the best job for me i want to start a tiktok account tomorrow and make a shit ton of money what would you is it is it that easy what would you tell them um i don't know it's really I, f- I found that when I did it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so easy. The videos are going viral so fast. <laughs> I really think that it's because I sort of had the experience making videos and I sort of, I maybe I was just really lucky. I had a, a unique point of view that people hadn't seen before and that my videos were good, that they people felt like they were really learning math lessons from me. I really feel like if you want to have a successful TikTok account, you ha- sort of have to have a different point of view. You have to deliver something that people haven't really seen before and you have to deliver a product that's of really good value you know it's one thing to have people's attention span for 15 seconds yeah. it's another thing to make them feel inspired and it make them feel like that 15 seconds has really taught them something new or given them something really interesting that will make them want to go click on your profile and want to follow you elsewhere that's a totally different thing so i would really say that if you're wanting to get into um this business really focus on your quality and not over quantity. I like that quality over quantity. So how often should be, people be posting if they are, are you, um, do you get into the weeds with that anymore? Or do you not really need to worry about it now that you've grown to a certain point? I don't know. In the beginning, I used to post every day because I had all these like ideas in my head from like math problems from school that I wanted to talk about. But nowadays it's like, I, I'll only maybe post like once or twice a week. Okay. Cause in the beginning I had so many more ideas, but now it's like, I really am. I'm just thinking like up a couple ideas a week. I'm having you give me a consultation now because I just started my TikTok (laughs) account two weeks ago. Well, I, what everybody says when you're beginning post every day, some people say post three times a day. Uh, I think that's a little bit too much. I mean, for me, I have to get ready for like two hours before I can even turn the camera on. So it's a little bit harder. Um, Yeah, I guess I really shouldn't complain then because I posted. I know. What's your excuse? I know. I put. I did a three. I did a three minute long TikTok the other day, and it took me like an hour. And I'm like, this is too much, (laughs) because to I'm used to going on Instagram stories and just you know like face to camera video, twenty seconds, auto captions, post, call it a day, and I'm like. They, these Gen Z people want us to do like actual video production on social media. It's kind of wild. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. There's, I mean, a 20 second like video, like an Instagram story would be a great TikTok. It just depends what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll see. We'll see. I had a, my other TikTok account. I probably did it for like three months and it definitely did not go viral, but we went to like 3000 followers and I was like, that's pretty that's wild. Great. It, I mean, it took me, it took me like three or four years to get that on my Instagram mm-hmm. account. Keep in mind, I'm talking about taxes. I'm not, you know, drag is a lot more visually, in- <laughs> a lot more visually yeah, interesting. Enough. So, maybe, know. maybe you have to get into drag. And, and no about, one wants to see that. No one wants, no one wants I want to see that. See that. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, it could be, co- I could follow someone's like makeup tutorial. It would be comedy though. It wouldn't be like, it wouldn't <laughs> be glamour. 
who knows? We'll see. We'll see. Okay. So I like to start to wrap up the show by asking my guests if they have any questions for me. So knowing that I don't know the Canadian tax system super well, but I could maybe get some general answers. We already talked about the bank accounts, but what are, is there a question you would have for me that you think might be helpful? Um, oh gosh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't really know how much the, the U.S. Um, tax system differs from the Canadian. I, I'll tell you the truth. I love talking about this kind of stuff. I totally would be one of your clients if you were in Canada or if I was in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's I was I've actually thought about what I would have to do to represent people in Canada. I'm sure I would have to hire a Canadian accountant to work for my company. And then, you know, mm -hmm. there's all sorts of dilemma, dilemmas around how that would work. But yeah. Um, well, anything else you would like to share here on the show? Um, no, not in particular. Okay. So to wrap it up, um, kind, thank you so much for coming on the show. Final question for you. Um, and I think that we probably know where this answer is going to be headed, but if anyone wants to follow you, see what you have going on, contribute to your business, how should they do that? Yeah, check me out at Online Kind on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, um, YouTube, and you can find my um, little math lesson over there. Just your viewership is enough. Beautiful. We will put all of those links in the description of our video in the show notes if people are listening on the podcast app. Kine, thank you so much for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Brayden. Thanks for having me. Hi everyone, it's me, Robin Sock for the cast of season 12 of RuPaul's Drag Race. Do you need help doing your taxes? Of course you do. You're stupid, but you're pretty. You might be a drag queen and you can do dips and splits and all of that other stuff. You can grab a dollar, two dollars, but are you paying Uncle Sam? If you don't know how, you need help. And that's why you need Business of Drag. That's right, you need Business of Drag. Taxes are a drag. Tune in for help from a pro. All right, all you drag performers out there, Taxes are stressful. We all know tax season. Taxes are stressful, stress causes wrinkles, and filler is not deductible. Hire us for help. You need it. You really, really do. Hey everyone, I help. Oh, there goes my titty. That is not deductible. Mm, okay. Hey everybody, it's me, Rockham Sock from the cast season. Oh, sorry. Hey everybody, it's me, Rockham Sock from the cast season 12 of RuPaul's Drag Race, and I'm here to tell you that if you're stupid and pretty just like me, you might need help on your taxes, because taxes are a drag, but you need to tune in for help. Oh, motherfucker. I, God damn it, I got this wrong. Okay, one more time. Sorry. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's me, Rockham Sock from the cast season 12 of RuPaul's Drag Race. You guys, if you're like me, you're beautiful, absolutely gorgeous, stunning. People run down the street just to get a look at you. But you're also insanely stupid and not good at doing things like math or handling your money. That's why Business of Drag is here. Taxes are a drag. Tune in for help from a pro. Might I add, taxes are stressful. Stress causes wrinkles and filler is not deductible. No, no deductee. Hire us for help. You need it. Business of drag! Pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. Or Uncle Slam will do, do a split on your throat, metaphorically speaking. Do your taxes. <laughs>